You got a Bible? Open it up. John, I've got two verses, going to have three, several verses up on the screen. I want you to open up to them. Years ago, I found myself struggling. And God was trying to work something into me. I can only give out what God has put in me. I can only testify of what I know God will do and can do. I would not ever stand before you and lie and exaggerate something if it never really happened that way. I can only tell you the truth of what God has shown me. When I was out in Oklahoma, going to Bible college out there, Oklahoma, there's a lot of charismatic churches. Um, Oral Roberts basically said that a 300 foot tall Jesus told him to build a hospital where everybody who went there was going to be healed. City of Tulsa told him we don't need another hospital, don't build it. He built it anyway, took everybody's money and built it. Basically now it's just office complex. It wasn't the exaggerated claims that he made it out to be. I say if you've got that much ability to heal people, why don't you go in hospitals and start from the top floor setting people home, healing them without pay. Tell the doctors they're not necessary anymore. But if you really have that kind of power, which I don't believe they do. But... Being surrounded by that, it makes you draw back away from, they would always use certain scriptures to say what it is they were saying, that whatever you prayed for, God gave you. Whatever you asked for, God had to give it to you. Didn't matter what it was. And the reason why you're sick is because you didn't ask God to heal you. The reason why uh, you were in sin is you didn't ask God to deliver you. The reason why this and that and the other is because you didn't ask and it's your fault and on and on and on and on. So I kind of pulled away from verses that are clear in the Bible about what they say about asking God for things. And God dealt with me because I was in a time in life where I needed God. I needed His help. And Rose brought in a stack of books one time, set it on my desk. It's from a family member that had passed away. And she said, they gave me the books and I thought maybe you might like them, go through them. They sat on my desk for, Christina, you know, it sits on my desk for months. And one day I was sour. I was very sour, sour mood. And had received some bad news. And I thought, everything I prayed for has turned to nothing. So I thought to divert my attention from what I was going through. So I started going through those books. The first book on there was a book by John R. Rice called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. And I went, I did not want to see that right now. Because I was angry at God. So I started going through it. And used to, years ago, when I'd go through a Christian book, I would bypass the scriptures. I said, I already know the scriptures. And I would read their comments. But God turned me around and now when I look at a book, I'm looking for the scriptures to see what it says. And God changed my attitude about praying and asking and believing. God changed my attitude. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Now in that statement, it says what it says. That you will ask and God will give it to you. Now there's an understanding that goes with it. 
But if God said these words, He means these words. Let's not shy away from it. Now, we don't need the name it, claim it crowd to come in and tell us what this is all about. We need more scripture for our understanding. Matthew 21. Turn there. Matthew 21. Underline these verses. Sister Waymeyer, bless her heart. I preached something one time and I, I said, I don't know if I've ever preached this before. She came up to me after the sermon, showed me her Bible. I had preached it several years ago. She marked it. She marked every sermon that she ever heard in her Bible. So-and-so preached this on whatever date. She kept track of it. Matthew 21, verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Verily means truly. It means you can believe it. It's verified. He said, If you have faith and doubt not, Ye shall not only do that, this which is done to the fig tree. What did Jesus do? He saw the fig tree that it produced no fruit. He cursed the tree and it withered that day and died. Jesus said, this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. By the way, there's a prophecy about this. Babylon the great. Cast into the sea. As a mountain. It's going to happen. And see here's the key. If you know God. And you know what his will is. You can't help. But to just ask for things and desire things that God already says he's going to do, he's going to do it. And you can believe that and live by that. And so he said, and all things, verse 22, underline this in your Bible, and all things. Circle the phrase, all things. What does that mean? Everything. Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing Ye shall receive. Now, I'm going to read that verse again. And you're going to read it out loud with me. Ready? One, two, three. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Do you believe that? In your mind, here's what your mind is doing. But, what, but pastor, but I've asked God for something. Did I not believe? Because it hasn't happened. Here's what I'm going to say to you. Be belief is actually simple. If you ask God, it is obvious that you believe that he's the only one that can answer the prayer. Is that what you believe? There was a lady that followed our ministry. I believe now she's got, now gone on to be with the Lord, but she would call me because she had a lung disease. She's on oxygen all the time. And she had her quote unquote friends. It sounded like Job's friends. They were bashing her constantly telling her, well, if you just believe God, you wouldn't have this disease. You could be healed of this. It's your fault that you're sick. I said, don't you believe that? She said, brother Mike, I've asked God to heal me. And I said, let me tell you something. He will. Even if it's the last thing that he does in this world for you. And my question is, what's wrong with that? To stop breathing down here, to live in heaven forever. That's not so bad. All things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Matthew chapter 7. Turn back a little bit. I should have put this in order, but I added these verses before Sunday school this morning. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. You know what James said? You have not, because you ask not. Now, is this Bible right or not? Amen. Is it true? For everyone, verse 8, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh 
findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Now he's going to make a, he's going to make a comparison. What man is there of you whom if, and underline his son, his son, if you are a child of God, he does not ever tell you no, never. I would ask you to challenge me on that with scripture. Where God told one of his children, no, I'm not going to do that. He didn't even say it to the Apostle Paul, who asked him three times to remove the thorn. Now you say, okay, that's a contradiction to what you just said, Pastor, because here's Paul praying three times that God would remove it, and God didn't do it. And here's my point. God is wiser than Paul, and God is wiser than you, is he not? Who's the adult? God is. Does not God know what's better for us? He always does. And instead of giving Paul this limited sight prayer request, God gave him better than what he asked for. Grace is better than having your thorns removed. If God put the thorn there, he's not going to remove it. I'm, I'm counseling with someone right now who God is making them aware of this very thing. God has given them a thorn. They never used to be this certain way, but now they are. And God has given them a thorn. I have one. I don't like it. But I have it. And I know, because I've asked God to remove it many times, more than three times. And I know for a fact that if it's the last thing that God does with me, he will remove that thorn. I know it. So here he's given the analogy here. What man is there of you who, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? See, bread is good. A stone is worse. Daddy, we're hungry. Can we have bread? Eat gravel. That's not a father. The father then goes out and does whatever it takes to make sure that his children have bread. He sacrifices even of his own to make sure that his children have bread. That's what fathers do. So he said, verse 10, or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? A serpent's worse than fish, not better. If ye then, being evil, Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? God is better to us than even we are to our own children. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking for bread and fish. Cornbread and catfish for my people. And I have nothing to give them. So would you, out of love for your children, give them bread to eat? Father, this man you sent our way this morning, he's going to leave here today. We're going to fill him with chicken and dumplings. And Father, we have nothing else to feed him with. Would you feed this man? 
He's going on a long journey. And Father, that road is dangerous. And there are temptations everywhere. And I pray, Heavenly Father God, that you would feed him and keep him, Father. That journey is dangerous. Would you bless him? Father, bless us all this morning. Teach us, God, how to pray, how to ask, how to believe, how to trust you. Open our eyes, dear God, and make us aware of things, Father, that we don't have because we didn't ask. And Father, forgive us of the sin of trying to do what we asked you to do or what we should have asked you to do. Forgive us for stepping in the way. Show us, dear God, how to live. Show us how to pray. Show us how to trust you. And we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Now turn to Luke chapter 2. Here's an example. Two examples in Scripture that God gives. We have Simeon. We have Anna. Luke chapter 2, if you remember, that's the chapter where Jesus was born. And the Bible says in verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout. You know what that means? He was devoted. He believed. He believed what God said. He was just and devout. And what was he doing? Waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for it. The key. I tweeted this this morning. I put this on Facebook. I posted this so that everybody who, who's ad, had this question in my mind, I've asked God for things. He hasn't given it to me. I don't understand. Am I doing something wrong? Am I not saying the right words? I have people call me all the time. Pastor, what are the words that I can say to God? How do I get God to do this? What can I say to God? How can I approach God? I, I, I thought I believed Him. Maybe I don't believe Him. I had people tell me that I didn't believe what I was asking for. That's why I didn't get it. And I would ask them, did you believe what you were asking for? Did you ask God for this? Yes. Did you believe that God could do it? Yes. Then let God do it. Let God do it. If you ask God to do it, it's because you figured out you can't do it. You are incapable of doing it. God is not in turn going to tell you, I want you to do it. Because you can't. So when this is all done, and on that day when we finally are around the throne of God... We are casting our crowns and our trophies and our awards at the feet of Jesus and not receiving them for ourselves. It is about Him and what He does and what He has done and what He will do, not about what we do. Brother Edge Kelly came here and he preached that message. There's two religions, do and done. And I've been taught to believe that if you ask God, it is done. It's done in heaven, and God will, in His season, manifest it and bring it forth. It's already done. Now, here's the man, Simeon, and he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, why doesn't he jump ahead and console Israel? He can't. It's not in his ability. It's not in his power. It's not in his strength. He doesn't even know how to do it. And he cannot manifest it. That's why he has to wait on God to do it. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. What does that tell you? God said to him he was going to do it in his lifetime. You know what the man did when, he, when Jesus came by? He said, that's it, I'm done. You can take me home now, I've seen it. My great-grandmother, a godly saint, and you had to be when you were raising, how many kids, 11? 13. And 11 of them was boys. On a sharecropper's farm, believed and trusted God, God told her that she would live to be 100 years old. She died at 101. She knew it. God told it to her. And she knew it was going to happen. She told everybody. God told me I'm going to be 100 years old. This man has been told by God 
that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So verse 27, he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. He said, I can die now because I've seen it. That is a life fulfilled by waiting on the Lord. He waited. He was probably an old man. Now, verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled. Notice that your King James Bible does not say his father and his mother marveled. The new translations do. It's a lie. Uh, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed him and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. You underline that because that's exactly what's happened. Israel has fallen and they're going to rise again. Say amen to that. Now watch this. And for a sign which shall be spoken against, yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now verse 36. Here's the other example. There was one, Anna, a prophetess. Ladies, the Holy Ghost said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Do you know what that means? That does not mean standing up in my pulpit. It does not mean writing my sermons for me. It means that you have the right and the responsibility to give out the word of God. Do it. There was one Anna, prophetess, the daughter of Phenuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years. How old is that? She's 84 years old. She's been waiting 84 years for Jesus to come by. How long are you willing to wait? How long are you willing to wait? For God to do for you what he swore he would do. She waited 84 years. And look at this, verse 37. She departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave things likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that look for redemption in Israel. You have two people in your Bible that are examples of waiting in hope. Waiting in hope. Now, you know me, I've got 30 verses of scripture. And I can't wait to give them all out to you. So follow along with me, Isaiah chapter 40. The only way I know how to preach this message is to give you scripture. If you, if you won't believe what God said, then you won't believe what I said either. Some of you have stopped praying for things because you have been led to believe in the discouraging thought that some things are impossible to God. I'm here to tell you, nothing is impossible to God. If God said He will do it, He will do it. God is not a man that He should lie. God is not Mike Hoggard that if you ask me, now pastor, will you do this? I'll do it. I'll get right on it. And then I forget about it. If you ask me to pray for you, don't be surprised when we stop right there and I start praying. Because I'll forget it. But I'm not God. God never forgets. God always answers your prayers. Somebody say amen. Always. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth... Look at how the Bible is describing him. He created the universe out of nothing. Out of absolutely nothing. He spoke it into existence. And there it is. Everything that we see in this earth. Everything that we can see in the heavens. God made it. He spoke it into existence. It appeared just like that. That's how powerful God is. God can do anything. The creator, the ends of the earth, fainteth not. Neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Brother Jason Cooley contacted me last night. 
He said he was scheduled to go out. They got big things going on there in, in, in Minneapolis in that area. And he was due to go out to preach in the streets to thousands of people, give out 3,000 gospel tracts. The devil hit him with a depression that it just drove him, just about drove him nuts. And he sent me a text message and he said, all I want to do is to get alone and get away from everybody. I don't want to go out there. I don't want to preach to them. I don't want to give out tracts. I'm in a hole. I don't know how to get out. And I told him, I said, sounds like to me God did that to you on purpose. He said, you know, you're right. He said, I used to go out all arrogant and cocky and get in people's faces. He said, now I preach to them because I love them. God got me down in a hole. And he said, I know what it's like to suffer. And I know what it's like to be in agony. And I know what it's like to be in pain. And I know what it's like to not want to pray. And he said, so God's got me down here so that when he does this thing, it's going to be him and it won't be me. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. I've gone through a bad time, a bad time. And I got a call in the middle of the night. Pastor, I need you to come to the hospital. My husband's dying. And I sat there at the edge of the bed, I was crying. And Lisa said, what's the matter? I said, I can't do this. She patted me on the back and she said, yeah, you can. I felt awful. I felt like dirt. And God gave me power to go be with a dying man in his last hours of life. To this day, I can't believe God brought me through that. Verse 30, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. Hey, my problem was I was young and cocky and relying on my own strength, my own stamina. That was my problem. And it was a huge problem. And God brought me down so low and God weakened me so bad and so terrible. I didn't think I was going to make it. Verse 31. Read this out loud with me. But they that wait upon the Lord. Let me hear you. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Do you believe your Bible? Now he did not say those who act. He did not say, God is waiting for you to take the first step. No, he's not. You have to make God make the first step. Israel was taught in the wilderness to follow the cloud. And if the cloud stayed, they stayed. And then they would get up one morning and they would look and they'd see the cloud over on the next valley. And you know what God did? God would sit there and he waited on them. He never left them. Never. Not in 40 years. God never left them there. And then they would pack up and they would get in line. And then God would lead them to the next place. Sometimes it would be in the middle of the night. And a trumpet would sound and they would rise up and they would see in the middle of the night that God had moved. And they had no choice. They had no choice. If God moved, they had to go with him. They didn't know where they were going. They had never been there. But they didn't move until God did. God is not waiting for you. It is you waiting on God. And he said, you shall mount up with wings as eagles. You know what that means? Angels. You be like angels. You know what angels do up in heaven? They wait on God's command. 
They stand like soldiers in line and they wait for God to dispatch them. Sometimes God will send angels out to the saint who has just breathed his last breath and they go accompany his soul and bring him into the presence of God. But they don't do that until God sends them. Your problem is not that you didn't believe. Your problem is not that uh, you didn't pray the right words. Your problem is that you not that you didn't have enough faith or that you said something negative or you wasn't sure whether God was going to do it. Your problem is you decided you didn't want to wait. Turn to uh, Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. I'm here. I am, I am standing up here. Literally. The product of waiting on God. God has done things in me that I could never do for myself. Never. And I'm here to tell you God will do it. What is your sin? That you can't stop sinning. What sin is that? That you've tried everything in the world to get away from. And it's always there. And you have asked God. God. Deliver me from this. God please take this away from me. And God will either do it or He'll give you grace. But He'll never say no. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3 is the key. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That, and I used to read this verse angry at God. God, why aren't you making me like this? God, where's the fruit? Why don't you, why don't you manifest this for me? And then I would read, that bringeth forth his fruit in his what? Season. You have to wait on it. You drive up north or drive over into Illinois and Indiana, you're going to see fields full of corn and soybeans. They cannot harvest until the season. And even at that, sometimes they got to wait for the ground to dry up. But that harvest is there and it's waiting for them and it will come in due season. God swore it. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us there is a time and a season for everything under the sun. When it is time, when it is God's season, He will do it. And you can believe that. Psalm 20, I'm going to read a bunch of Psalms to you. I'm going to fire them off at you one after another. I got a semi-automatic Bible up here. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed but transgress without cause. You ought to be ashamed for getting ahead of God. You ought to be ashamed for trying to do what you ask God to do. You're going to fail at it. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Yes, you are going to see other people prosper. Yes, you are going to see other people get what they want. God's wanting you to wait. Isn't that what your grandma tried to teach you? Am I right, Deanne? She, as soon as I said that, she went, yep. Yeah. Your grandma said, good things come to those that wait. Your grandma and grandpa knew the value of waiting. Waiting on the Lord to do what you cannot do. You know what I'm doing right now? I got some things. I got some very serious things that I'm praying about. Very serious. You know what I'm doing? 
I'm waiting. I have wanted to jump into action. And God has told me through my wife to wait. And she was right. Wait. If I've asked God to do some things, I must not do them myself. It'll be a big mistake. So I'm waiting. Psalm 37, 9, more semi-automatic Bible verses. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Do you believe your Bible? Do you believe that you'll inherit the earth? You'll, you'll get it right out from underneath the United Nations. God's going to give it to you. The meek shall inherit the earth. You know what meek people do? You keep their mouth shut and they wait. You know what we're waiting on? Jesus to come back. How long have you been? How many sermons, Sister Betty's? My row of Betty's back there. How many preachers in your lifetime have you, have you heard say, I believe Jesus is coming back in my lifetime. And they're in a casket right now. Right? He didn't come. You know what Peter said about that? So there'll be, there'll be scoffers coming in the last day saying, where's the promise of his coming? Where is he? We are going to act. No, you're not. Because if you're in the body of Christ, the body obeys the brain. And if the brain doesn't move, the body doesn't move. There's a song in contemporary Christian music. I hate it. And it says, if we are the body, how come his hands aren't healing? How come his feet aren't moving? And it basically lays the blame for all these people suffering and dying and going to hell on the church. And the church won't do anything. Listen, if they really are the church, they can only do what the head tells them to do. Only what the head tells them to do. Cannot do it any other way. So you know what? There are people plunging into hell. You know why? Because they want to go to hell. They do not want to serve God. It is not the church's fault. They only do what God tells them to do. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From Him cometh my salvation. My soul wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from Him. And I guarantee you, you open this book of Psalms up, you're going to see God tell you to wait, 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 wait. Now turn to Psalm 104. And Psalm 106 and Psalm 145. And Come on, I got my semi-automatic. It's, that barrel's hot. Psalm 104, verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. These, what? Verse 27. These do what? They wait all upon thee. God feeds every fish in the ocean. And every bird in the air and every squirrel who's climbing our pecan tree, stealing our pecans. Those are Bethel Church owned pecans and we got, church, we got squirrels stealing them. They think they're theirs. You ought to see it. I'll sit out here in my window and there'll be a train of squirrels running back and forth to that pecan tree out there. You know what? Those squirrels know that God put them there. That's their food. They're going to need that for winter. All we want to do is make a pie out of it. Am I right? These all wait upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in what? Season. That thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. When you hear me pray sometimes, you'll hear me pray, God, open your hand and feed us. Is God's hand not open? Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. Thou renewest the face of the earth. Who does all that? God does. Let me ask you this. Who are you praying for? <laughs> who are you praying for to be saved? If you're praying for somebody to be saved. If you're not, shame on you. 
If you're not praying for somebody to be saved, shame on you. Somebody prayed for you, did they not? I watched my brother-in-law rise and fall many times. Many times. And I begged God one day. I thought I had him in church. I baptized him. I went out visiting, tried to keep him in, kind of try to keep him coming to church. I'd go out there and he'd have a beer can in his hand. And I was so let down. And I saw him one day come to a church, a family function. He had an oxygen bottle. He was as white as a ghost. And I prayed one prayer. God, before he dies, let me sit with him. I want to know whether or not he's going to heaven. I prayed that one. I prayed one prayer one time. And I had it all worked out in my mind how it was going to happen. Have you ever done that? Had it all, had all, whole scene painted, had a movie made of that whole scene. And God did that better than I drew it out. And that man's in heaven right now. I'll answer that later. God saved that man in due season. Because he came to me and said, Mike, I want to make sure I'm going to heaven. I said, you are. And that Friday morning, he stood before Jesus, clothed in righteousness. The wickedest man I've ever personally known is in heaven right now. Who are you praying for? Are you praying for children? Lost children? Wayward sons? Wayward daughters? Are you praying for grandchildren? Wayward. They weren't raised the way you raised your kids. They're not in church. Did you know that that does not matter to God? God dealt with me one morning about one of my children. I thought I had it figured out. And God said, Mike, I can save anybody at any time and I don't have to bring them to church to do it. So who do you think you are thinking you've got my plan figured out? Because God asked me, did I trust him? And I was going to lie to him and said, yeah. And God knew I was lying. I did not trust him. I trusted me. And I yielded over to God. I said, God, he's yours. You can do whatever you want to with him. Psalm 106. I got, I got to close this out somehow. Or I'll just keep preaching. Let's do this. Let's go to Acts and Romans, and I'll close. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. The Holy Ghost was going to be delivered to them, but God told them to wait on it. Now that is in direct contradiction to this nonsense crowd who thinks they've got to bring everybody in the church and give them the Holy Ghost. Now we've got to dance now. Now we've got to say these words now. Now you've got to get up and you've got to praise Jesus 30 times. And you've got to say hallelujah a bunch of times until the tongue starts rolling out. Then you'll say. And they said, we've got to prime the pump. That's not in the Bible. They waited. If you want the Holy Ghost, you wait on Him. I promise you He'll show up. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to be done. I'm going to let you go. Romans chapter 8 verse 18. For I reckon... That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I waited. All the time, God, God said, Mike, we're going to study prophecy. Oh man, I'm going to eat it up. And God just poured, just flooded me with Bible verses and scripture and understanding and just filled me. And I thought I was going to bust. I said, God, what, are we, what am I going to do with all this? God, what, what, what did you do to me? You gave me all this. I had no way to get it out. I didn't know it wasn't time. This man's here because I waited. Because I didn't have a choice, John. 
John and Melissa are here because I waited. And in due season, God opened up doors and said, now go here. Now do this. Now I want you to do that. Now add this to that, and then I want you to add this to it. Mike, are you busy? Not yet. Now do this, Mike. Now add this to it. Now go, now come do this. And I'm not happy if I don't preach seven, eight times a week, every week. I feel like I let God down. God did it when I couldn't do it. And you just wait on God. For the earnest, verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. He's telling us to wait. You want healing in your body? Wait for it. You want God to rid your cancer? Wait for it. Go ahead and ask God to take it out. Go ahead and see a doctor. Let God do what God's going to do. God has taken cancer right out of some people. Has he not? But some people he didn't. Is that because they're not worthy? Is it because they're more wicked? Is it because they didn't ask right? No. That's just a different way that God was going to manifest his grace in their life. I'm telling you right now, my wife and I are closer than we have ever been in our lives because of what she's been through. Verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. But by reason, you know what vanity is? Having to sit around and wait. 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 Not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. He's using words like shall be, not may be, shall be. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Of course you're suffering. Of course you're in pain. Of course you've suffered loss. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by what? Hope. Hope in what God will do. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Verse 28. Read that out loud with me together. And we know that all the... Let's start this again. And we know... Let's do that one more time. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Give God a hand this morning. Wait! Wait for it! Wait on God! I promise you, when you get it, you'll realize there would be nothing better for God to do that in your life. And I promise you, God will do it better than you ever thought it could be. My life with my wife is better than it's ever been. It only took 32 years. It's not that it was bad and then it got good one day. It's just been getting better every day. And God did that. Not me. And not her. So you ask God to do something. You ask God to fix broken relationships. You ask God to fix marriages. You ask God to fix children. You ask God to bring back prodigal sons. You ask God to give healing. You ask God to give this. You ask God. You just might as well ask and ask and ask. We've got a big God. And then you trust Him while you wait on Him. Be patient with God. He's patient with you. Let's bow our heads. If, if you want to come down here and pray, you're more than welcome to. But I want to pray with you right now. Make a list. Write it down. Put down the date of the day you prayed it. Keep it in your Bible. 
five years from now, ten years from now, you're going to mark things on that list. This is what God did. People call me all the time, tell me what's going on, and they'll tell me their problems. And I usually end the phone call with, six months from now, call me, tell me what God did. I want to hear it. And I get these calls from people. Hey, Pastor Mike, do you remember me? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And then they'll start reeling it off. This is what God did. I say, see, I told you. You wait on God, God will do it. God's delivered drunkards from alcohol, but he did it in season. God delivered fornicators and adulterers from the lust that they could not, they could not curb on their own. God delivered them from it. God delivers people from cigarettes, delivers them from marijuana and drugs, which you ought not use. God delivers people from these. He does it every day and He does it all the time. If it's worth having, it's worth waiting on.